I don't get worried on April 12th. Okay. I get worried. So when? When are we checking back? When are we checking, checking I back? I get worried at the All-Star break if the Astros are 10 games out of making a playoff spot. Five ball. Onto the track. At the wall. It's gone. Home run. Turns on a ball. Deep right field. And gone. What a game. What a moment. What is up, my friends? Welcome to Flippin' Bats, where we had another wild week in the game of baseball, and we're going to talk all about it. We're going to talk this week in Shohei Otani news, which if you've been living under a rock, you might have missed that the federal investigation of the whole gambling situation came to a conclusion. We're going to talk all about that. Uh, we have making a statement where we'll talk um, Tyler Glass now. We're going to talk the Houston Astros struggles and Jackson Holiday number one prospect in all of baseball, finally got the call up to the big leagues after so much time. I'm really, really glad the Orioles sent him down for those 10 games so he could figure out how to play the game of baseball. We're going to talk about that. Uh, this is going to be a fun show. Alex, we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, this will be This will be a fun one. You know what else was a fun one? Last time I saw you, you were in Texas wearing mm -hmm. solar eclipse glasses. So how was Texas? How was the eclipse? Was it as magical as all of the images from Texas looked? I should have uh, continued to wear those glasses. Honestly, the, I I watched the episode back and thought they were a good look. <laughs> Maybe those will be. It was be, epic. And yeah, just yeah. to clarify, you can't see shit out of them. They're yeah, like, yeah. they are pitch black unless you're staring <laughs> at the sun. But other than that, yeah. they look great. Uh, I had... I had a lot of fun. It was honestly the coolest experience. And I took so many photos that were pointless because yeah. you just can't well, quite Yeah, like through the glasses. What, I saw so many people. What you're looking at. Yeah. Through the glasses, videos, whatnot. It was just, I don't know. It was incredible. And it was, I said it last week, it was the longest total solar eclipse with total coverage since like 1877. So it lasted a good few minutes of yeah. seeing that it was unbelievable. Um, I, I had a lot of fun and then ended up watching the, uh, watching the Astros play the Rangers that night. And, uh, it was just a, a great, it was a, a, a great, a great trip. Yeah. What a, what did you see? I know you told everyone the eclipse was Saturday, so hopefully nobody listened to Alex because she told everyone to go outside and look at the eclipse, and now they're all probably blind. What did you? What? What did no, you actually I like, see? I, it's so funny. Um, I almost blinded myself. Producer Taylor actually texted me like, "Hey, have you gone outside to look at the sun or the eclipse yet?" And I was like, "Ooh, grab my sunglasses." Like, it's like, "Oh yeah, let me go look." Look straight at it. I was like, "Idiot, what am I doing?" So no, I didn't see anything. I didn't have the glasses. I, so I wasn't was Monday. prepared. That was Monday. Do you know what? I didn't, I don't know what LA, I think it was like a very partial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, okay. You I, were in the ideal yeah, yeah, yeah. viewing area for this entire clip. So yeah. good for you. Happy for you. Thank you. It was cool. But you know what? It's about that time. It is about that time, Alex. For my favorite segment of all time this week. And Shohei Otani news, and boy, oh boy, was there a lot this week, Oof. specifically the last couple of days oh, yeah. in regards to Shohei Otani. We are going to talk all about the conclusion of the federal investigation into Ipe, his translator, his interpreter, and we're also going to talk about his uh, his offense as of late. But Alex, I, I do want to talk yeah. uh, about the conclusion of this investigation into Shohei and Ipe. And the conclusion is that federal authorities conclude that Shohei was a victim of fraud. And Ipe Muzahara, longtime interpreter and friend of Shohei Otani, has been officially charged with bank fraud after it was discovered he transferred more than $16 million from Shohei's account, which we originally were hearing the number $4.5 mm -hmm. maybe a little more. Well, this is a lot more, 16, over $16 million. Now, there were a lot of bets. Mm -hmm. The bets were placed from December of 2021 to 2024, as recently as March of 2024. So I did the math. That is 821 days. I went from December 1st, because it said December, I went from December 1st until March 1st. That is 821 days about 23 bets a day, every single day, with an average bet size of $12,800 were made by eBay in a span of just over two years. 
Winning bets, uh, he totaled 142 million. Losing bets totaled 182 million dollars for losses of just over 40 million dollars. Now, the Department of Justice, who uh, were part of this investigation, also noted that in that time there was not a single bet on baseball. There were about 19,000 bets made. This is important. There was not a single bet on the game of baseball. Investigators also relied on recorded phone calls from the bank in which Ipe falsely identified himself as Shohei Otani to trick and deceive bank employees into authorizing the transfers. Now, some important questions come up from that, and one of those being, well, what? how did he have access to that bank account? The bank account was set up by Ipe himself in 2018. So take that in for a second. Ipe set up the bank account for Shohei. And in 2021, bank records show that the email and phone number on file for the account were changed to Ipe's. He also turned off notifications and confirmations of transactions for the account. Wild stuff uh, happening there. And, and the conclusion being that Ipe did indeed commit fraud and over $16 million worth of it. And, and I wish, I wish this was the end of it. I really do. I wish we could all realize that in a sad situation that Shohei Otani is, is a victim here. And I wish we could all move forward from this. I do understand. I really do. I understand all of the questions that came about during the period of first hearing okay, Ipe stole money from him and had this gambling problem and there's going to be an investigation. Naturally, the, the internet experts on fraud and gambling came out of the woodwork. Turns out 99% of the internet are gambling and fraud experts and they were all very loud about this and a lot of questions came about and I really do understand that. They were fair to ask at the time. But the facts are now the facts. And there is a 37-page criminal report with all of the facts. If you don't want to read a 37-page criminal report, a criminal complaint on the crimes committed, I totally understand that. That is totally fine. But then you have no room to go around spreading a bunch of bullshit without any facts at all when there are now absolutely facts to the contrary. Continuing to ask questions like, how do you not know when $16 million is is out of your account does no good. It it doesn't do anybody any good to ask those. Those are questions that are none of our business. We have the facts now. And the facts from a, a federal investigation that concluded that this was fraud after being privy to about a million more details to this story than than anybody in the in the public realm. So Unfortunately, what we're seeing is nobody likes to admit when they're wrong. So all of a sudden, these conspiracy theorists that had all these ideas out there that thought Ipe was some sort of fall guy are only continuing to get louder. And I just don't understand. I I don't understand why people want Shohei to have done something wrong here. Why? To to make you no longer look like an idiot for the questions you were asking uh, originally? nobody's, there's nobody mad at the questions that were asked. I think that is all fair, but now we have the facts and, and facts are the facts. There is a federal investigation that proves his innocence. Simply calling Ipe his interpreter is, is just misleading. It really is. He was his confidant. He was basically a manager and he weaseled his way into a position in Shohei's life to be able to do this to him. Shohei was let down and bamboozled by his best friend. Let's not forget here in all of this that Shohei Otani is a human, a human with real emotions, a human that can can hear the things that people are saying and, and, and those affect you as a human being. He is a victim. He is a victim in all of this of his best friend committing an unthinkable crime. And let's just, let's just remember that in all of this. It's tough because I, 
I understand why this might be hard for normal people to comprehend $16 million going missing. But there are so many factors here that come into play for Shohei Otani, right? The biggest one being, you have to understand, he was moving to a new country where he was coming into a new language. So Ipe was his guy for everything. He was communicating for him. He was helping him set up bank accounts. He was talking to his agents, to his financial advisors. Ipe controlled so much for Shohei Otani. He, con- he controlled his English image. He was Shohei Otani's voice, right? So Ipe had 100% trust from Shohei mm-hmm. Otani. And apparently, as we're learning access, way more access than anybody would ever think to understand or comprehend. It's just so sad once you realize how much he was embedded in Otani's life, his trust. And for someone like Shohei Otani, moving forward, how do you let someone in and trust someone again as much as he did with Ipe? Yeah. And that's kind of the human side of it. This was, yes, his interpreter, but his best friend and his family. Yeah. And and for a guy that, you know, I, I said it a minute ago and, and you mentioned it, a guy that did everything for him when he came over, yeah. including setting up his bank yes. account. So if you really want to ask all of these questions, well, every question the bank could possibly ask to verify a, a, that it's Shohei, Ipe set up those security yes. questions. Ipe knows all the answers. Everything. Every, all the he answers knows to those questions. Everything. Yeah. He was his voice. He was his voice to the American people and to every single person that Shohei Otani came in contact with, from the coaching staff to his teammates, to his agents, to his financial advisors, yeah. to the bank to set up the bank account, yeah. which yeah. is crazy to think about. And this happens more often than people know about. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. And he was, he was shutting off, he was shutting off the people that needed, there was a bubble that was created by him. And I, I I saw in, in the report that basically, I I think his agent tried to ask about the account, about the account. And he basically said, Oh, he doesn't want to talk about it. He just trusts me with this. Like he He said, there's no gifts, right? Cause they were doing, it was like with the, um, his accountant for taxes. He's like, no, there's no gifts. Uh, there's no interest coming in on this account. Like it's fine. He just wants to leave this account private. So they tried, but then you also have to question the people that Otani has helping control his finances. This is why it's so important when you're making hundreds of millions of dollars to have checks and balances. You need to have multiple people checking in on people because again, as we've seen throughout history, when this much money is involved, it can corrupt anybody. It can corrupt a family member. It can corrupt a close friend. It can corrupt someone who is in control, supposed to be financially responsible with your money. Yeah. I just can't get... Has 19,000 bets in over two and a half years. Dude, that, the is, fa- like, that is wild. It is mind blowing the amount of money. You have it on there again? How much he how much he won and lost? Hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah. you guys. The winnings and losing, winning 142 million, losing 182 million. That's, that's you know, crazy. 300 and 320. For million someone dollars? who doesn't make a million dollars a year. Yeah. He's making $300,000. Hmm. Wild. It's crazy. So the uh, <sighs> the investigation has concluded. And yeah. uh, those, I'm sure there will be a lot more that comes out specifically with what is going to happen to Ipe and all of this. And and more details are going to continue to, to come out. And obviously we, we will talk about those here. But uh, the investigation has, con- has concluded. And there is a 37-page criminal uh, complaint if you want to go out there and, and read that. But that's a lot of reading. That's a lot me. of reading. So uh, we did it for you. Yeah. Uh, so, but undo a little. Yeah, let's get back yeah. to what Otani does best, which is playing baseball, you guys. And last week, we we focused on his slow start, but you actually called it, and he's starting to heat up at the plate. Alex, I, be- I believe what I said were the words, by this time next week, yeah. he will have at least one more home run and double the RBIs. So yeah. let's take a quick backtrack and look back at to, to his stats at exactly this time last week, where he was hitting 270 with a 749 OPS, which is why we had the conversation of, 
is Shohei, what, what's going on? Like, these are good numbers, but not Shohei numbers. And he had one home run and four RBIs. Well, here we are exactly one week later, and he has three home runs. So he tripled his home run total and eight RBIs. He had four. Mm -hmm. I'm no math expert, but I did just add up 182 and 142. And I can tell you that (laughs) eight is double of four, meaning he exactly doubled his RBI total and he did heat up. And it was, it really, the reason I said that is because I've just, this might shock some people. I've watched a lot of Shohei Otani playing baseball Uh and I can sort of tell when he is locking in at the plate. And, and I didn't notice any big struggles or swings and misses. It looked like he was starting to lock in by hitting the ball to the opposite field, by driving the ball to the opposite field, the left center field gap, which is where he's at his best, I think. And all in the span of a week, he hit 423 with a 464 on base percentage, hit two homers, four RBIs, and slugged 923. So now you look up after a week of people saying, what's going on with Shohei? He's not at his best. Well, now what? He's hitting 333 on the year with three homers, eight RBIs, and an OPS over 1,000 on the year so far. Shohei Otani is locked in at the plate. I continue to be as excited as I was at the beginning of the year when I thought this is one of the greatest athletes in general of all time because of how good he is on both sides of the ball. And now, though the injury sucks Mm -hmm. and it's not allowing him to do what he does best, which is a a two-way guy, it is allowing him to be laser-focused on one task for the year. And that's not hitting and going out and playing defense. His one task is hitting. And I think this year we're going to see some historic numbers from him, some career numbers from him, some stolen base numbers being up a little bit higher, his RBI total being astronomical because of the team he's playing on. And the week that he just had, uh, I I think, proves that. He is locked in at the plate and has great numbers right now. And one of the homers he hit at Wrigley was with one arm. He basically swung with one hand, hit it out down the right field line. Ah, The man is locked in, Alex. Can we just, like, yeah, he's locked in, but I think on top of it, the first part of this conversation, like how impressive it is, the mental control that he has with everything going on, having a slow start, this crazy investigation going on, coming off of a massive injury and still being able to take a beat and then figure, figure things out. Now he's heating up at the plate. It is, it is a whole, a whole nother part to this. The beginning of this season, let's not forget flashback three weeks and this that's when he's first learning about all of yeah. it. You're on it's, a new team, uh-huh. a new organization, living somewhere still totally different. You up and move to a different part of, of the state, over to Los Angeles from Anaheim. Everything in your life has changed yeah. already. And then you throw in the fact that you're Best your friend. most leaned on confidant, the mm-hmm. guy, the one person that you came over from Japan with, your yeah. interpreter on your team over there that came here to be your interpreter with the Angels and was the one person you could lean on and was your English voice mm-hmm. to to the the American people over here. Yep. It turns out he was a fraud and and stole 16 plus million dollars from you and you find that out the day your season is starting with mm-hmm. a with a contract of of 10 years and all of that money. And you find that all out on the same day when you're already probably pressing a little hard to impress on, on your new team. Yep. Then you find all that out. Just think about that. Yeah. If you're take that in and just think about all of that happening at once and to start the year hitting 270 with a 749 OPS and to hear what is, what is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Everything. One, his swing looks great. Let's pump the brakes on on any struggle talk. And two, his whole life was just turned upside down. And three weeks after, his entire life was turned upside down. We're sitting here talking about the man having a 333 batting average on the season with over 1,000 OPS. This man, yes, I said earlier that he's human, but good Lord, he's a different human than the rest of us. Oh, yeah. No, it takes all of the greats across every sport have this crazy mental control and a situation like this with everything that's going on, the list you just went down of everything is going through a new team, 
crazy investigation, losing your best friend, now trying to play baseball and recovering from a massive injury, he's still great. Yep. And he's coming together and he's figuring it out. Yep. And uh, that talk does it for this week in Shoyo Tani News. Alex, I got to yep. say. Looks pretty cool. Um, and it's the gotten. graphics look pretty cool. New team, as we just mentioned. Yeah. New organization. A lot happening. And you know that means for flipping bats and this week in Shohei Otani news, it means new graphics, new light show that happens. There it is. <laughs> we can pop it up whenever. Just a totally new look. And uh, new shirts are in order. They got to be blue now instead of the red. So just a lot of new stuff happening here. And uh, it looks, that was the first time seeing it. Yeah, so that, that, looked, that looked awesome to, to everybody that helped put that together. Thank you. Yeah. And that does it for this week in Shohei Otani news. Well, uh, speaking of new, let's talk about someone whose big league career has just begun. Yesterday was the debut we have all been waiting for. Jackson Holiday, baseball's number one prospect, made his big league debut with the Orioles. Yeah, big league debut Wednesday night for the number one prospect in all of baseball. And uh, it was just a, it's a really cool moment for the game of baseball. The kid is 20 years old. He's the son of, of Matt Holiday. So all of the videos that were coming out, I just thought Chills. Was, was it was awesome. so cute. You could see the kid of like four years old yeah. sitting on the field at, at Coors Field hitting. And here he is getting to the his call up to the big league, still looking four years old. Yeah. And being told that you're going to be a big leaguer is truly unbelievable. So I did say it earlier. It is wild to me that the Orioles sent him down for a total of 10 games makes and no said, sense. yep, now oh. he's figured it out. This is the one that got me. Him, like, playing catch with his yeah. dad. That's oh, my really God, cool. he's so cute. It, you know what does, what does frustrate me about the whole thing and him getting sent down for 10 games is that when we went into spring training, yeah. the Baltimore Orioles organization said Jackson Holiday has a chance to make the team out of spring training. Why say that if that was a lie? Yeah. He did everything he could have possibly done in spring training to make the team, and he didn't end up making it. So there was no need to say that. But ultimately, he did end up getting the call. Uh, April 10th was the big day. Gets called up. Gets to make his debut at Fenway Park, mm -hmm. which is really cool as well. Uh, the debut didn't go as he would have wanted it to, or I think as, as many people, maybe everyone besides Red Sox fans wanted it to go. He did go 0 for 4. Did get himself an RBI on a ground out, but not the best game in the world. But I, I just think it's a really cool moment for the game of baseball because, man, oh, man, was there and is there a lot of hype for this kid. He is going to be, I, I think he's going to be a, a, an all-time great in the game. I'm not going to go ahead and put, you know, put any pressure on the kid one, one game into his career, mm -hmm. but I think that that's the potential he has, a number one overall pick, comes up with all the hype in the world because of his his dad being who uh -huh. he is and being drafted number one overall. Um, so it's just really cool to see his debut. I am excited to to watch his career develop. I did I did draft him on my fantasy league. My team name is the Jackson Holiday Truthers. No, so I am very oh you're pleased. all in. I'm very pleased all with in. his call up. I, I, I and you know that I, I, I was I, all you've in been before. raving about him. Yeah, raving yeah, yeah. about him. But he grew up in and around the game. Right, obviously yeah. with his dad. Have you seen the setup that they have at their house? The ultimate sports barn where uh, yes. he trains. It's like an athlete's dream. Batting cages, pickleball courts, basketball court, uh, golf simulator, wiffle ball field. Like he literally like was set up to have the most insane sports experience. Yeah. To be the best possible. Look at this. Be the best possible athlete that he could be. It's it's wild. Yeah. It is, but it I'm is happy because not all of them live up to that expectation. And he flew through the minor yeah, league system to get to this moment and to have this moment. And it is just the beginning. Okay, so I'm going to do a fill in the blank. Okay? okay, Jackson Holiday is the biggest debut since blank. I'm going to say Jackson Holiday is the biggest. And most anticipated debut since I'll say Bryce Harper. Okay. I'll say Bryce Harper. If you if you remember all the Bryce Harper hype, of course you do. How could you not? He was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Yeah. Uh, so I'll say since him. Okay. If you had to put a top five together, yeah. who would your top five be? Oh, okay. Let's put together a little top five 
uh, top five most anticipated debuts, we'll say since 2000. Okay. So I'll start with, I'll go number five, Shohei. Because Shohei came over, didn't go through a, a minor league sort of situation, but did come over with a ton of hype. Because all we were hearing is there's this guy two that plays player. in Japan, yeah. that a two-way player that throws 100 miles an hour and can hit 500-foot homers. So naturally, that creates a lot of hype. And then he comes over to spring training, and it wasn't the best spring training in the world, but just to see a guy pitching and hitting, there was a ton of hype around Shohei. So I'll have him at number five. Okay. And then I'm going to put, I'll put Jackson Holiday in at number four. I, I do think the hype was there. The number one overall pick, the son of, of Matt Holiday, the stats that he put together in, uh, in his minor league career were nothing short of, of remarkable. The guy hit 350 in his minor league career, had an on-base percentage of almost 470. Those are Ted Williams-like like numbers. I mean, the, his minor league career numbers were almost unfathomable. Unfathomable. Yep. That's a tough word to say. You Ooh. chose it. Uh, I did. I knew <laughs> I knew I wanted to say it, and I knew it was going to be a tough one to say, but I still went with it. So, uh, so all of that combined, and then you start saying, okay, well, when are you going to call him up? And then it's, well, the kid's 19 years old. Can you call him up? They didn't end up doing it last year, and this is all building up the hype. And then you get to spring training, and it's like, this is the number one prospect in all of baseball. He is 20 years old now, and he has a chance to make the team. So a lot of eyes were on him in spring training, and he did absolutely nothing but build that hype even more and more and more. And then he makes his debut. He gets that call up, and I, I, I do think since 2000, Jackson Holiday is certainly a top five uh, most anticipated debut. Uh, that was, that's, so he'll be number four on my list. Also. Okay. So you still have mentioned Bryce Harper. So there's two more. What What's the top three? My three, I'm going to go with Mark Pryor. Uh, Mark Pryor's, uh, Mark Pryor's debut was one that I just, it was one of the more anticipated pitching call-ups of all time. If, if we're being honest, he was the consensus top player in the 2001 draft. Uh, ended up going number two behind Hall of Famer Joe Maurer. Pretty pretty good name, if you ask me. Uh -huh. And then he signed for a record $10.5 million, which is the highest of, of all time until uh, Steven Strasburg ended up breaking that. And then in his minor league career, it was a very, very short stint in the minor leagues, made nine minor league starts, made his debut in 2012. 2002 at 21 years old and he struck out 10 pirates in six innings picking up the win so everything that just i i've never seen a more highly touted up to that point and i know i was only 10 but i hadn't seen a more highly touted pitching prospect uh, than him a guy that came out of usc pit his junior year at usc was 15 and one with a 169 era and 202 strikeouts in 138 innings remarkable. The hype was there. And this was really pre the fact that he had that much hype pre really social media and yeah. the buzz you can get there is remarkable. So I have Mark Pryor at number two. Or okay. Three. So when I asked you to fill in the blank of Jackson holidays debut as the biggest sense, you said Bryce Harper. So we got two left. Is he, yes. is he one or two? Bryce Harper is going to be number two. Okay. Uh, so Bryce Harper, again, cover of sports illustrated, uh, Sports Illustrated called him the chosen one, huh. by the way. Uh -huh. And his his whole story was something that we all knew by the time he got drafted. He was a guy that left high school, dropped out of high school, got his GED his junior year. Then he went to a, a junior college in Nevada as a catcher, used a wood bat in at this junior college, and then went on to just hit 31 homers, had 98 RBIs and 68, 66 games. 31 homers, won the Golden Spikes Award at a junior college. It only happened once before ever. No junior college players are winning the, the Golden Spikes Award. So then he's drafted in 2010 by the Nationals, drafted him first overall, uh, signs for $9.9 .9 million, a five-year deal in the final minute of the deadline, if you guys remember that. And then in 2012, makes that debut at 19 years old. Imagine all of that. Imagine dropping out of high school yeah, that's crazy. To, to pursue your dream of being a baseball player, dropping out of high school, getting your GED, going to a junior college, using a wood bat 
winning the best, winning the award for best college baseball player out in the country, then getting drafted first overall, and then getting called up at 19 years old. That is so much hype to try and live up to. And all he's done is gone on to win two MVPs, had some of the most clutch home runs in the history of the Nationals and the Phillies. Uh, we've seen a couple in person during their playoff mm-hmm. runs. Uh, I I just, I think for, uh, in terms of some of the most hype debuts ever, I know we're talking here since 2000, but it's tough to beat Bryce Harper. Okay. Who's and number to one? to me, there is only one name that does beat him, and it is Steven Strasburg. Uh, all of the hype there. Coming out of San Diego State, uh, the numbers he put up, 13-1, and one, a 1.32 ERA in college, through 100. Now, we're talking when he was drafted in 2009. Again, a last-minute deal, last-second sign. But this is when we're talking, well, social media has a little more, a little more play in the world at this point. You're starting to see videos of Steven Strasburg in college and starting to see videos of Steven Strasburg shooting the way, shooting up the system. And you're starting to hear words of this guy's throwing over a hundred miles an hour as a starter. And I just feel like when he came up to finally make his debut after announcing that he needed Tommy John and then his first rehab start didn't come until 2011. Then he was on an innings limit. Steven Strasburg's debut against the Pittsburgh Pirates was for me, and I think many other people out there, especially with my age, a a moment where it was, where were you when? And maybe for me, it's just because I was at my high school beach week and we were all partying, <laughs> by the way. Uh-huh, big memory. First time I ever, ever had a sip of alcohol in my entire life was at, at Beach Week. Maybe that's why I remember so. Maybe Definitely. they're synonymous. Uh-huh. Uh, was that week. And I do remember just sitting down, watching him, thinking this guy is going to be one of the greatest pitchers ever. And unfortunately, that is not able to, to come true because of the arm injuries and the nerve damage and and a lot of injuries came up, but you cannot for a single second argue the dominance and the hype that Steven Strasburg had coming up. And he did go on to win world series MVP in 2019. And that to me sort of just felt like the swan song for Steven Strasburg. He gave every single ounce that his arm and his body had to go out there and pitch multiple times in that world series. He went on to win world series MVP. And unfortunately we are never going to see him pitch again in the big leagues because he has retired due to all of these injuries, but man, Oh man, that hype, mm-hmm. that hype was on another level. Uh, so what about other guys like a Mike Trout who kind of outshined Bryce Harper that first year, they both ended up winning rookie of the year in the national league, American league or a guy like Yamamoto after getting the biggest pitching contract in MLB history before playing a single game here. Do you not consider that? They were all considered. Okay. But I had five to pick from the one in the top eight. I think, I think David price is a guy that was in my consideration as okay. well. Gets drafted out of Vanderbilt and is pitching in the world series. The year, the year he gets drafted with, with all the hype he had as well. He was considered. Um, yeah. Trout for me, wasn't Mike trout. Wasn't supposed to be what Mike trout became. Yeah. I, 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 there was not the same amount of hype there as with like a, a Bryce Harper. Um, certainly went on to become, I would say better than, than Bryce Harper. And that's a lot to say, considering the other guys, Harper's a two-time MVP, but Mike Trout's one of the greatest of all time. Um, yeah, there are some names, uh, with a, with a ton of hype to come up, but it was a tough list to put together, Alex, but ultimately what I came up with was Shohei Otani at five, Jackson holiday at four, Mark Pryor at three, Bryce Harper at two and Steven Strasburg at number one. Fun list to put together, though. Yeah, it is. Now it's time for making a statement. Let's do it. You ready for it? So if you're new to this segment, I'm going to be given a strong statement, and Ben will either agree or disagree with the statement. So let's get started with Dodgers pitcher Tyler Glasnow. Tyler Glasnow is now the NL Cy Young frontrunner. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. There's, there's not a world in which I feel like you can't say that. And I, I would, I feel pretty good about 
The, the question for me has never been, does Tyler Glass now have the stuff? Can Tyler Glass now be good enough to win a Cy Young award in his career? The question has always been, can Tyler Glass now stay healthy enough yeah. to win a Cy Young award in his career? So I can sit here and talk about stats all we want. I mean, the guy's 3-0. and He's got a 2.25 ERA. He's already got 29 strikeouts and has a whip well under one. A 0.75 whip and those 29 strikeouts in 24 innings. Punched out 14 guys the other night. We can talk about his stats. And we can talk about how good he is and how hard he throws and how he's added a new pitch to his repertoire that makes him even better. He now has a slider to pair with his fastball and his curveball. But it almost feels to me like an irrelevant conversation. Tyler Glass now can and will win a Cy Young Award if he can stay healthy and throw somewhere between 150 and 200 innings. I feel confident saying that. That's how good he is. And we should all be rooting for the guy to stay healthy. 100%. He's, he's extremely dominant. He has fantastic hair. He, he's a guy that's just a lot of fun to watch pitch. So I'm going to say absolutely. Uh, Tyler Glass now is now the NL Cy Young favorite. And uh, I think he should be. Let's it, just hope he stays healthy so we can see what he can put together over the course of, again, 150 to, to 100. I, I, I would hope for 170 to 200 innings would be awesome. And I would love to see the strikeout totals he could put up. I mean, he's a guy that can put up, you know, 250 strikeouts in the season. It also helps that you're on a team that continues to drive in runs and is giving you that support on the mound to get those wins. I mean, he's now on one of the best regular season teams in baseball over the last decade. So yeah. hopefully he's one of those pieces they add this year that can help them get over that playoff hump. And then we get to see him pitch in the World Series, my World Series prediction. I will continue to pump up the Dodgers all season. And that's different how than any other season? Wool. 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 Yeah, they got one of our favorite <laughs> players on the team. So, yeah. Let's move on to our next statement. You okay. ready for it? Yeah. I just did it again and you called it me out. It happens every, and I know, look, we're going to talk about the Astros here and it's not a great conversation and driving in. I knew Alex was thinking, I didn't even okay, mean to. I can't do I, it. Ben called me out for giggling when forgot. I have to talk I bad about the forgot. Astros and here she is. Forgot. It's happened so naturally. I completely forgot. <laughs> Whew, okay. Uh, our next statement. It is time to worry about the Astros. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Uh, I am, I am going to say that the Astros are in dead last place yes. in a division that has the Oakland A's. Your favorite team. <laughs> um, the Houston Astros are four and 10. Yeah. And this statement of it's time to start worrying about the Astros. I'm going to disagree with how, how can you, they, they were in last place in the AL West. They if were only, swept by if the If only Royals. I was planning on telling everyone okay, how. Go. Okay, go. I'll tell you how. Okay. The Astros are notoriously slow starters. They don't have their rotation in any bit of good shape. Justin is around the corner from getting back. He has one more rehab start, and if that goes well, then he's coming back. They just got good news about Framber Valdez that he's started to feel much better and going to start throwing, so... It, it appears like dis disaster averted there. You're hopefully getting McCullers back at some point. This rotation is going to turn around. The bullpen, the seven, eight, nine guys have the potential to be the best in baseball. They have vastly underperformed to this point. Let's not expect that to happen. Let's all take a deep breath and remember that it's April 12th. So we're two weeks into the season. And now let's take a look at those AOS standings. Why am I not worried about the Houston Astros? Again, because it's April 12th. The leader in the division, the Texas Rangers, are not 13 and 0. They are 7 and 6. The Houston Astros are three and a half games out of first place. Let's chill out. They're going to be fine. The offense is great. The pitching staff is around the corner from being better, and the bullpen has underperformed, and we know they're going to be a really good bullpen. It's not like Josh Hader and, and Abreu and Presley are just over, overnight, one season to another, going to become really good arms. 
all time, you know, Josh Hader is a, is a, is a great, one of the all time greats. If you look at his numbers, it's not like one year to the next, he's going to just become a bad closer. Ryan Presley up there in the all time saves leaderboard for the Houston Astros. Uh, Abreu looks like he could be the best of all those arms back there. And you got him pitching in the seventh. These guys are going to be good. And also you got to get the lead to start to start having those guys shut down games in the seventh, eighth and ninth inning. And they haven't been doing it much. So am I worried about the Houston Astros? No. And I get, I get why we're asking this question. It is ugly. They were losing nine, nothing in the first inning on, mm -hmm. on Thursday with Hunter Brown getting absolutely torched by the Royals. Um, so I, I do get it, but am I worried no, they are notoriously slow starters. I feel like we have this conversation every single year and all they have to do is get into the playoffs. So Alex, I, I can tell by the way you asked me that question of how that you would say yes, and that's fine. But what I would say is, do you want to make a deal with me right now that the Houston Astros make the playoffs? I have them getting in as right a now. wild card team. You had them two weeks ago getting in as a wild card team. So what you're saying is if you had them getting in two weeks ago and now they're sitting here at four and 10, do you still believe that they are going not, not do you think or want your bracket to come true? Yeah. Do you think as of right now that the Houston Astros get into the playoffs? Cause I would take that deal in a heartbeat that they do. They just have so many questions in the pitching situation right now. Right. Nailed. And, well, Framber, Urquidy, Verlander, guys that aren't performing well, that should be performing well right now. And you can hit as much as you want, but when you're giving up all of these runs, it's That's hard true, for your yeah. offense to come back and take this game. So at what point in the season, as you said, they're notorious for slow starts. At what point of the season in another two, three weeks, do you start to worry well, it's about not the fucking Astros? April 12th. I'll tell you that much. It's not. I, I don't get worried. Spicy. I, and that's not to you. I don't get worried. Spicy. I don't get worried on April 12th. Okay. I get worried. So when? When are we checking back? When are we checking, checking I back? I get worried at the all-star break if the Astros are 10 games out of making a playoff spot. Okay. That's um, when I get worried. Not on April 12th. And I, and I, I get, mm. I totally understand the question. And the Astros yeah. look terrible. Yeah. Terrible. But there are a lot of question marks. Some of those question marks get answered soon. Some of those question marks are in the lineup with guys that just aren't hitting yet. Like Alex Bregman, who's started to seemingly hit the ball a little bit harder in the last few days. And Altuve, who hasn't had a great year yet. Am I, am I worried about those guys putting together uh, seasons of hitting under 200? <laughs> no. So there are a lot of question marks. And there are some question marks that are a little more worrisome than others. So I get that we're having this conversation, but they're three and a half games out of first place. April 12th is not when I get worried about the Houston Astros. It's more like June or July. And I just think, no, I'm okay. not worried. I would say the Astros make the playoffs and I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame you if you now wanted to, to go against me in that deal that I'm offering you. I no, do I'm not say, taking the deal. I, I originally put them getting in as a wild card team. So They'll you sneak in. So you are now not worried about the Astros. Are, would you say after this discussion? I, I would say I'd be worried about them right now because they're having an extremely tough start to the season with a lot of big question marks with a lot of big names on their team. Yeah. So, yeah, I would be worried. It's okay to be worried, but also think, oh, they'll figure it out and they'll slide into the postseason. And if they get into the postseason which I think they will. I'm not worried about it. They're the Houston Astros. Say it with me, Alex. The what? Astros are no. inevitable. <laughs> 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 All right, that wraps making a statement, and it is time for our flipping shout-outs, where Ben and I will shout-out either a player or a team that might not be getting talked about as much right now but deserves a spotlight. So, Ben, who is your flipping shout-out to? Uh, mine this week is going to be Rowdy Telez. Friend of the pod, by yeah. the way. Loved having him on. Um, and now he's with the Pirates. And the reason that I am shouting him out is because David Bednar, who over the last couple of years has been one of the best closers in the game of baseball, has been just downright bad to start mm -hmm. the year. As The Pirates, uh, I think, have... It's four losses, and again, we we record on Thursdays, and they do play later in the day on Thursdays, so we don't know. But the tire, the Pirates have four losses, and David Bednar has blown three saves. Mm. And the other day, got booed off the field, basically. Blew another save, got booed by the Pirates fans, 
And what Rowdy Telez did, I believe we we have a sound clip of it, but what Rowdy Telez is he stood up for David Bednar in the uh, in the locker room. Let's listen to that. First, this should all be put on air. Uh, this is the pride of Pittsburgh to everybody. We don't do that out here. Uh, we're a good team. We're winning for a reason. Uh, we're going to get our man back on track, but what happened today is, uh, I think, unacceptable, and we as a group in Pittsburgh got to be better. It's an all-star for a reason, and uh, we just have to be better. So that being said, two-time all-star. So I, That's I just, great. I love it. Yeah. And I would also say, like, there's nothing wrong. If you are a paying, if you're a paying customer and going to a game and tired of seeing it, I, I don't like booing. I wouldn't go to a game and boo, but, but I, I get it. It is what it is. You're, you're frustrated at your closer. It's happened again and again and again. So you're frustrated. And although he's been great for you in the past, baseball and sports and life is really, what have you done for me lately? And lately, David Bednar has not been very good. But what I love about this is just the act of a teammate yeah. going over to his locker in front of cameras, putting his arm around him. This wasn't for an act. It was for David. It was to go up and put his arm around him and show we have your back and we are going to publicly have your back. And I just thought that act as a teammate was enough to shout out. I, I love that from him. And I really, he's a great guy. And it, it, Bednar was clearly emotional about it. Yeah. And to have your teammate have your back is something that can help you get through something. I mean, it's huge. I mean, that's what a, a veteran should always do in the clubhouse. And we talk about like emotional leaders too, right? The clubhouse have guys that kind of keep everybody together, that pump everybody up, make sure everyone stays on track. Even if they might not be that leader on the field number wise, there's always those guys in the clubhouse, in the dugout, that we don't see things happen, but this was like a very public opportunity yeah. for us to see how important it is and how it can bring a team together. Yep, absolutely. What is, uh, so Rowdy Telez is mine. Alex, who is your shout out? My spotlight this week is Mike Trout. In case anybody forgot, the three-time MVP is still that guy. Now, Trout is off to a historic start to his season. The home runs are just flowing for Trout. He's had three home, uh, three straight games with a home run. He set a club record on Tuesday, the fastest player in franchise history to reach six home runs to start a season, getting there in just 11 games. And I kind of have to remind myself sometimes like why he doesn't get all the attention out of the gates and throughout his career, his accomplishments have always kind of been overshadowed by the lack of the team's success. He's also been dealing with a lot of injuries the last couple of years. He yeah. only played 82 games last season because of that hand injury. But Trout's been crushing any concern that he's lost a step due to injuries the last two seasons. He is still that guy. And he's been the best in the game for over a decade. And Trout was, he's been compared to Mickey Mantle a lot throughout his career. Yep. But yesterday, or on Wednesday, he played his 1500th game. And the stats came out of Mike Trout against... Mickey Mantle, and they are pretty yeah. darn similar. It is pretty cool. I'm going to read a couple here to you. Like, so at bats, Mike Trout, 5,400, uh, 443 compared to Mickey Mantle's 5,353. So Trout's had a little more yep. at bats in this. Their runs, almost similar, eleven around 1,100. Uh, Mickey Mantle around... 1,200. Uh, hits, Trout has 1,636. Mickey Mantle, 1,651. Home runs. Mike Trout has 374. Mickey Mantle, 359. Stolen bases, Trout, 208. Mickey Mantle, 119. I, batting average, Trout, 301. Mickey Mantle, 308. I, they're slugging percentage trout 583 mickey mantle 577 like it is wow it, it's it pretty is incredible how how similar they are and will probably continue to be and i just i hope the the conversation can end a little differently because unfortunately mickey mantle's career uh, dealt yeah. with a lot of injuries towards the end of it and you know we We're had started that. to have that conversation with trout but yeah. uh, i think this year shows well let's pump the brakes for a second anybody for one split second that thought Mike Trout wasn't still one of the best players on, on planet earth. It may be the best player on planet earth. Well, 
Look what he's doing. By the way, he's got six homers this year and eight RBIs. Shout out to the Angels for never getting on base. <laughs> so many solo I, homers. It's just it's unbelievable. Somebody help the guy out. Somebody help the guy out. Like, gosh, he just deserves to play in the postseason so bad. And he has never won a playoff game in his career. <sighs> Anything else you want to talk about? That's nope, that. That's it. That's it. So wrap it up. Uh, fun episode. Uh, Friday. Today is Friday. Tomorrow's Saturday. You know what that means? Saturday with Smolt is tomorrow. And it really, really is. There's a really good conversation. And those that have listened, listened to Smoltz before know that he is very passionate about pitchers and their arms and staying healthy. Well, we had a really in-depth conversation about all the arm injuries coming up over the last couple of weeks, really the last few years. And I thought it was one of my favorite conversations ever with him. So check that out tomorrow. Thank you all for listening today. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. Follow along uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. And you can watch every single thing we do as well on Spotify and on YouTube at Flippin' Bats Pod there. And at Flippin' Bats Pod on TikTok, where we are trying to get to 100,000 followers. I believe we just got to 87,000 followers. So we are getting closer and closer there. Go follow along with everything we do there. But thank you guys for listening, as always. Until tomorrow, my friends, remember, find your bat and flip it. Peace.